Hey, I'm John Timmerman, and I'm here to dissect the world's most exciting businesses and brands so that both you and I can build our own faster. And today I'm talking about John D. Rockefeller. That's right. The richest person in U.S. history. Now, why am I covering somebody who, you know, has been gone from this earth since 1937 and whose companies sort of no longer exist in their original form? Well, it's because number one, he's the richest person in history. So I've always wondered how he became that successful. And number two, I wanted to look at some of those, uh, some of the background behind his story and how he applied what he learned to his businesses. And also, is that even possible ever again? Can somebody become that rich? So first of all, if you look at his net worth, most calculations uh, bring him to about $340 billion. His net worth uh, was $340 billion. Now, that, now that was adjusted based on the current GDP at that particular time, and he equated to about 3% of the total GDP DP of the United States. So if you keep that percentage of total GDP and you look at what the GDP is in current in the current day, also you adjust for inflation and you land at around $340 billion. Now, if you compare that to the current richest person in the world, who is Elon Musk, um, well, I guess that's before his shares dropped a little bit recently, depending on when you're watching this, but with his Twitter announcement, um, all that went down a little bit, but at his peak, it was about $218 billion. So John D. Rockefeller, even adjusted for inflation, was still more than $100 billion richer than the richest person on the planet, which is crazy shocking. So who was he? He owned Standard Oil, which was an oil monopoly. In fact, before 1911, he owned everything. He owned about 25% of the entire conglomerate. Okay, and that wasn't even at his richest point. In 1911, the U.S. Uh, came to Standard Oil and broke them up because of antitrust laws that were uh, established in the late 1800s. So, in 1911, Standard Oil was brought broken up, and it was broken up into the largest oil companies in the United States today. So, some of those companies that were that were uh, uh, derived from Standard Oil are BP Oil, Exxon, Chevron, Conoco, uh, the biggest oil companies in the U.S. Uh, and his his net worth actually rose because, and this is why monopolies are not good, right? Because they crush everything around them. They crush innovation. They crush growth. Growth. They crush competition, and they don't allow for that competitive effect to help these businesses grow. So when Standard Oil was broken up into these multiple companies, he still owned 25% of those companies. Okay, and because those companies now could compete against each other, innovation happened, uh, you know, competitive advantages happened, and his net worth actually rose fivefold beyond what it was when Standard Oil was still a monopoly, right? So lesson number one is comp competition is good. Every day at Good Monster, I think about my competitors. Now, some people might say that's bad. Don't pay attention to your competitors. But I look at my competitors for inspiration and what they're doing. And it causes me to go back to my executive team at Good Monster and say, hey, this company's doing this. Maybe we should try it. Or this company's not doing this very well. There's a gap in what they're offering. We should offer that over here. Okay, this competitive advantage allows us to do things that maybe we wouldn't do if there was no co competition. So that's the first lesson is that competition is good, even though it might frustrate the shit out of you. Okay. So that's crazy, right? Th those numbers are crazy. Um, so a little bit about his background is that he studied bookkeeping and finance early on. That's how he sort of got into the business world. And this is something that I wish I did as a young entrepreneur. And I definitely wish I knew a little bit more as a teenager. Now, whether I would have paid attention or not, that's another story. Uh, but I wish I learned finances in a more applicable way early on. You know, going through school, they don't teach you about real life finances. You know, you're in economics class and it's like, here's how the, you know, GDP works, right? That's good. But they don't teach you about personal finance. They don't teach you about professional finance. 
that's something that I wish I learned a little bit more early on. John D. Rockefeller did. A lot of successful people understood finance early on, and some of the richest people in the world are in finance. So understanding finance is another lesson that you can take from this as an entrepreneur or a business owner. Understand the finances because you'll understand profit and loss. You'll understand balance sheets. You'll understand net worth. You'll understand you know shares of companies, dividends, all of that kind of stuff that make the wealthy world go around in today's day and age. Okay, the next lesson is that John D. Rockefeller started Standard Oil when that industry was booming, okay? The industrial age was booming, and oil provided a way for cars and machines and the industrial revolution sort of to, you know, to go around, right? Other big players in the industry... Carnegie and Vanderbilt, right? Carnegie with steel, Vanderbilt with railroad. They also were building their empires in emerging sort of industries. The railroads were the ways that they, that um, companies got things from A to B faster uh, than, say, horse and buggy, right? Uh, the auto industry relied on fuel to run its cars. Auto industry and railroad and bridges and most everything else relied on the steel industry to build their stuff, right? So another lesson that you can take is to pay attention to emerging industries. Right now, we are in the crypto, NFT, blockchain sort of emerging world. And yes, it's risky. And yes, it's going up and down and highly volatile. But there's such, so, so interest, there's such interesting things going on in that industry that if you want to become the next version of the wealthy United States or wealthy world, pay attention to that. And your business, whatever your business does, whether it's in finance or marketing like mine uh, or service uh, or uh, culture building uh, or pr products or B2B, it doesn't matter, manufacturing, there's going to be some sort of application that you're going to be able to find if you look uh, when it relates to crypto and NFTs and blockchain technology. Blockchain is going to help security. It's going to help things be more secure, right? It's going to help things be faster. Uh, crypto is going to be most likely at least a way that people will pay for th goods and services. NFTs are a way to kind of merge goods and services together by offering things that uh, people can't get without you know, buying a membership or uh, you know, being a part of a certain club or something like that, right? If you don't know what I'm talking about, you can look up NFTs to get a, a, a sort of rundown. But pay attention to these emerging technologies because they're going to be the next generation of the industry that you're in, okay? So those are the lessons for today that I'm going to take away from John D. Rockefeller and apply to my business. Particularly, I've already started to learn a lot more about finances. I did this probably a decade ago, and I've really been uh, conscious about learning the smart ways to manage finances. And I try to keep learning every single day, especially as a CEO and a business owner, but definitely as an entrepreneur and a startup founder. Okay, I'm already paying attention to emerging technologies. For instance, NFTs are going to play a real role in consumerism because uh, we're already seeing this companies, brands, right? So popular brands, they're on social media, they're, you know, e-commerce brands can create NFTs or partner with other companies to offer an NFT, which will get you access to things like coaching calls or things like private clubs, right? A company can sell, let's use Yeti. Yeti can sell this mug right here. They can sell this mug for 20 bucks. I go to the store, I buy this mug for 20 bucks. I look at the bottom and there's little code or a, a little you know key that I can use and I get access to an NFT, non-fungible token. That's what an NFT is. And that NFT gets me access to a private community of camping enthusiasts, okay? And those camping enthusiasts get... $500 off an annual camping trip hosted by Yeti. You can only get it if you have a Yeti mug and it's limited to a thousand people or something like that, right? 500 people. Okay. That's an example of how an NFT, a digital sort of token, a, a digital pass gets you access to something. That's how consumers are going to be able to uh, engage on a deeper level with brands. And that's how brands are going to be able to engage on a deeper level and encourage people to uh, uh, engage with their brands on a deeper level, right? 
So these are emerging technologies. Uh, and uh, the lesson that I already mentioned, the, the third lesson, is competition. I respect my competition. I love my competition. I look to them for inspiration. I don't, I don't, you know, put blinders on and not pay attention to co- competition because it's going to skew my my thought. I look at them for inspiration. Without a doubt, all my competitors are doing something better than I am. So if I pay attention to the things that they're doing better than we are, it allows us to come back to the table and make plans to become now better than they are. Thanks for watching. And just a reminder, I own a company called Good Monster. We're a performance marketing agency that has worked with clients like Amazon and Google and Microsoft and Samsung and Toyota uh, to help deliver better results and higher marketing ROI. If you need help with your marketing, just Google Good Monster or shoot me a message and we'd love to work with you. 